Hello and welcome to uh, this presentation on sustainable uh, investing uh, by Tilney. Uh, my name is Louis French uh, and I am the lead sustainable portfolio manager uh, of our managed funds at Tilney Smith and Williamson. In this session, I will highlight the growth of sustainable investing, uh, some of the challenges that remain for investors looking to do good with their savings and provide an overview of how we navigate the green maze when constructing our portfolios. I believe there is a toolbar at the right hand side of your screen uh, with about and participate. Throughout the session, uh, please feel free to submit uh, any questions in the Q&A box uh, as part of the participate tab. Uh, and I'll do my best to answer these at the end of this session. Uh, Tilney also have a sponsor area at the conference uh, where you'll be able to ask any questions uh, and to speak uh, with one of my colleagues, uh, Ross and Miles, I believe are, are, are online today. And for anyone watching uh, this recorded session on demand, we'll also be uh, more than happy to speak with any ACT members after the event, and we will make the slides available to download. Now, hopefully this should work onto the next slide. And there we go. And what I have provided uh, to begin is a brief overview of Tilney, Smith & Williamson. Uh, for those watching today uh, that are less familiar with our business, uh, we are one of the UK's leading uh, wealth management firms with over 180 years of heritage and local offices uh, across the UK uh, and in Ireland. We are very much experts in financial planning and investments uh, with strong relationships with individual clients, charities and corporates. Uh, when it comes to ESG and sustainable investing, uh, a large number of firms are now trying to uh, reposition themselves, uh, but few have Tilney's long track record and real expertise of managing money uh, in this part of the market. We offer a range of services to our clients, including our centrally managed sustainable portfolios, bespoke client portfolios and charity accounts. Uh, as clients, you have access to a range of materials produced by our experts, uh, which includes uh, both online videos and investment guides. Sorry, some few issues of the slides. Uh, the next slide briefly highlights some of our history and track record. Uh, for example, our flagship and unitized TAP sustainable portfolio, uh, which is available on most platforms, is now 15 years old. Our sustainable uh, multi-model uh, portfolio service um, reaches its 10th anniversary this year. Uh, and as a group, we are signatories to the principles of responsible uh, investments, which is highlighted in the middle of the screen. Uh, and we are proud to also be part of a firm uh, that gives back to local community and good causes via the Tilney Charitable Trust. The, the Charity Trust um, was established in 1979 and since then has donated over three million pounds uh, to local and national charities. And during the pandemic, uh, this has included do uh, donations to support frontline NHS staff. Uh, and lastly, um, we were delighted uh, to be voted the uh, best ESG strategy at the City of London Wealth Management Awards uh, recently in a very competitive shortlist. Uh, it is investors themselves that determine uh, the winners in each category of these awards. And we would like to thank everybody uh, that voted for us um, at the awards, um, like I said, was quite recent. Now, hopefully that is a, uh, enough about who we are. Uh, and to really kick off the discussion on sustainable investing, I have highlighted three main reasons for why responsible and sustainable investing cannot be ignored. Um, hopefully, uh, by attending today's presentation, you're already engaged uh, in this area. But for anyone less familiar, these are all very important factors uh, that we believe you need to be aware of. Firstly, we have uh, growing interest and, and demand to do good with savings. And it's clear from various market studies that investors are increasingly looking to line their savings uh, with their personal and political beliefs. Uh, and this, this grew uh, very much with the pandemic with that greater focus on uh, both health and well-being. And we often refer to this as the Attenborough effect, uh, which is linked to obviously the world famous uh, broadcaster, Sir David Attenborough, whose documentaries such as Blue Planet have really shone a light, um, the spotlight on the world's environmental challenges, including climate change, plastic pollution and deforestation. Uh, as treasurers, uh, you will have your own experiences of this demand, but the fund flows across the market, which I'll highlight shortly, largely do speak for themselves. Financial advisors also need to be prepared to talk to younger clients about sustainable investing. And from an investment perspective, uh, there is expected to be a generational wealth shift, um, estimated to see one trillion pounds of assets 
uh, move between generations over the next nine years towards younger savers. And you only have to look at recent elections across Europe to see the growth in support for green parties and also the kind of repositioning of larger parties and more established parties towards eco-friendly policies, particularly in the build up to COP26 in Glasgow later this year. So we don't see this demand profile changing, uh, only actually only accelerating, uh, particularly over the medium term and the longer term. And secondly, uh, the, the second point we would like to make is obviously the increasing uh, regulatory and uh, increasing regulatory focus on ESG, which is linked to this political mem momentum. And we believe that clients need to be aware of this, uh, this focus as the finance world attempts to both promote sustainability uh, and tackle uh, issues such as greenwashing, uh, which I'll come on to uh, shortly. And thirdly, um, we'd like to just promote, <laughs> not promote, but highlight the, uh, the performance the market performance of this area, uh, this part of the market, and also that greener economic recovery, uh, which again are linked to both demand uh, and changes in, in regulation. Now, starting on the kind of the, the market growth, and on, on this slide, we've highlighted uh, the rapid growth and record year in 2020 uh, for funds claiming to be ESG friendly as that client demand linked to the Attenborough effect and the uh, new European disclosure regulations have come into force both shining that uh, spotlight on sustainability and making this very much a mainstream part of the investment market. And from our experience at Tilney, this demand is coming not only from individual savers, but also corporates and the likes of charity and pension funds, which have new fiduciary duties to uphold when it comes to ESG and sustainability. Now on the slide, I've highlighted some recent data from uh, Morningstar and Lipper on this incredible growth. You will see over $1.6 trillion at the end of 2020 are now invested in this area of the market. In uh, 2020 alone, there were over 300 new fund launches in the European segment. And this chart on the right highlights the growth of funds available to UK investors, according to Lipper. For those less familiar, uh, the Morningstar Global Sustainability Fund universe includes open-ended funds and exchange-traded funds globally uh, that claim to have a sustainability objective and or use binding ESG criteria for their investment selection. Um, the vast majority of flows have been witnessed in Europe, uh, including the number of new fund launches, um, with asset managers not only launching new products, but also seeking to repurpose old products under a sustainable uh, banner as part of these regulations. The European market, what I would say is the European market is very much more established than the US, Asia and the emerging markets, but they are playing catch up now and we are seeing more, uh, more products launched uh, in the sustainable area. Uh, and this is again linked to that kind of EU regulatory requirements which come into force uh, from March uh, that have very much kept uh, fund managers and asset managers uh, busy uh, and an increasing demand to disclose ESG risks um, within our reporting frameworks. Uh, this does include Tilney Smith and Williamson uh, and we have plans in place to improve our own reporting um, in the months ahead as we move forward. However, some asset classes um, still have few options in terms of funds. Uh, with proven track records in particular uh, and despite these new regulations to improve transparency uh, greenwashing is a real challenge uh, for clients and for fund selectors like myself um, when trying to construct portfolios uh, and on, on the next slide we highlight some of these greenwashing and mislabeling challenges uh, particularly in a number of the passive products uh, available to investors which you can see on the chart in front of you on the left side um, have grown significantly over the past five years. So this is the bar chart um, highlighting the growth of um, global ESG ETFs. Uh, now, greenwashing, I believe, is the biggest challenge that we face. And we've added this slide to help our clients not hopefully get caught out by some of the noise in the market, uh, which I know fills up a lot of our inboxes uh, with various new product launches. On the right-hand side, um, you will see the top 10 holdings uh, from the published fact sheets of two UK funds. Uh, one claims to be ethical uh, and the other ESG. Uh, and we've, we've included this as an example just to highlight some of the problems here. So unfortunately, some advisors and investors would only look at the uh, fund names and low management co uh, costs in this example and invest without reviewing much further into their investment policies or their actual underlying holdings. Now, whilst ethical and sustainable and kind of value considerations around issues such as uh, alcohol are very subjective, uh, and some clients wouldn't have an issue with investing in the likes of Diageo, which you can see at number two on the top one and uh, uh, in the other holdings on the bottom one. Um, we actually believe that most clients looking for an ethical and sustainable solution 
would be pretty surprised to see um, global mine, mining giant Rio Tinto uh, feature in the top 10 of both of these holdings. And here lies one of the major problems that is not unique to these examples. Most passive products and active funds, uh, and some active funds, sorry, still rely solely on third party ESG data scores and are more focused on the tracking error of the underlying index than the actual underlying companies that they're investing in. And this is before we even consider issues such as engagement or the disparity bef uh, between ESG, third party ESG scores, uh, which can vary significantly. So, for example, um, some ESG data providers would score a company such as Rio Tinto as high risk, given its operations, obviously been in the press um, around destruction of um, sacred Aboriginal sites in Western Australia. And that's kind of a view that I personally would share. But for other ESG data providers, <clears throat> they may score Rio Tinto well compared to mining peers because of its disclosures and the amount of resource it has to put in into its disclosures uh, and its reporting. In the two examples listed in front of you, uh, it's quite clear uh, that it's the latter case and the, the ESG data provider has scored Rio Tinto fairly high, highly. And that dominance of the UK market still towards the likes of kind of uh, large cap um, oil and gas companies or tobacco companies is why these two example funds have also included the likes of Royal Dutch Shell, BP uh, and some of the tobacco companies in their top 10 uh, in previous years. So we just highlight this to be aware of. And like I said, you will have your own views on sectors or companies that you might want to avoid within your investments. And deb debates regarding certain industries and or companies are very much commonplace. Um, however, to avoid greenwashing and mislabeling, um, we spend a lot of our time and resources looking under the bonnet um, of where a fund manager invests and not just relying on a glossy uh, sales aid uh, when it comes through to the inbox. And now this does include a, a kind of a range of due diligence um, activities before we invest, screening portfolio holdings, uh, engaging with our fund managers and also directly um, with our actual companies. And then lastly, we've just included on this slide a quote um, from Tarek uh, Fancy, on the, uh, who's the former head of sustainability at BlackRock. Um, and this was uh, widely quoted uh, in, the, in the trade press um, at the start of the year. Uh, and let's just say he was far from impressed with the, the kind of moves on sustainable investing, particularly in the US. And we thought it was quite, um, <clears throat> quite interesting given the uh, size of BlackRock as one of the world's largest asset made managers uh, that someone of this position would, would, would make such a statement. Now, moving on to the uh, next slide, hopefully, if this allows me to work the screen still. There we go. Uh, and in response to these greenwashing challenges and to promote both green and sustainable investing, a number of voluntary and regulatory initiatives have been launched in recent years. And I'll highlight today just, just a few to be aware of. There are many. Uh, and since 2018, we estimate that um, there have been over 170 ESG-related uh, regulatory measures proposed, uh, which is more than the previous six years combined. Many of these are still being finalised, and questions do remain around the likes of MIFID II uh, in a post-Brexit world. Uh, but it's clear that the direction of travel will clearly put a greater emphasis on the link between kind of client su suitability and sustainability of the investments. Now we are, as a firm, constantly reviewing uh, new guidance on the likes of ESMA, um, which is in, the, in Europe, on the new sustainability uh, financial disclosure regulations, the new uh, EU taxonomy for asset managers, uh, and in the UK where we expect the FCA to introduce similar measures around the uh, task force on climate-related uh, financial disclosures uh, and improving that transparency for, invest for investors, which is obviously the ultimate goal um, of, this, uh, of these new regulations coming through. Now these sit alongside a raft of voluntary initiatives across the industry, uh, such as the principles of responsible investment, which I highlighted earlier, um, and that we are very much signatories to. Now the EU SFDR, uh, for those that are less familiar, <clears throat> is now live at level one, it went live in March, uh, and is linked to the European Commission's action plan on sustainable finance, um, which was announced back in 2018. Like many firms, uh, we continue to receive legal advice on kind of what the final regulations will look like, uh, particularly for the level two uh, and onwards, and the roadmap, which kind of gears up over the next two to three years. Um, but in summary, all investment funds that kind of are available to Euro European investors, like our funds are, uh, need to needed to declare in March how central sustainability is to their investment processes. Now, these rules allow for uh, three levels of integration. You have um, Article 6, uh, which indicates limited ESG integration and uh, in consideration in the investment process. You have Article 8, uh, which is for funds um, that have a sustainability focus. 
like our own funds, uh, and Article 9 funds where there is a clear sustainability um, objective um, in the investment objective, such as a binding carbon reduction target over a certain time, time point. Um, now, the vast majority of funds in our portfolio are highlighting that they are going to be Article 8 and Article 9 funds. Uh, a lot of that is a little bit of nervousness, nervousness around what that kind of end requirement is from a regulatory point of view. So some are opting for eight, some are going for a nine. Uh, and this does just highlight the commitment to sustainable investment, um, given the, uh, the amount of work that's involved with these uh, disclosures and regulations. Um, but what I would highlight, there is, there is a huge challenge when it comes to kind of improving that, that transparency for investors. Uh, and at the moment in the market, and we're involved in various uh, conversations across the market, there is a bit of a kind of data deficit on, on, on how some of the funds report. So it's going to be quite interesting to see whether the next stages of the SFDR are delayed or whether they can go ahead um, from January next year. But we'll wait and see what happens there. But what I would say is, you know, we very much believe that, you know, these regulatory changes uh, alongside a number of the uh, voluntary initiatives, such as the PRI, will actually help with the issues of uh, green greenwashing uh, across the market by improving that transparency. Uh, for example, um, as an example, um, sorry, for example, as a signature of the PRI, uh, we know that the, the amount of commitment that is required uh, and, the, and the level of disclosures that we have to submit in our annual report um, to the PRI. Um, we are working very closely with our colleagues across, across the Tilney Smith and Williamson Group um, to improve a range of our policies um, that help put responsible and sustainable investing uh, very much at the heart of everything that we do. Uh, we're also supportive of the um, United Nations SDG framework, which is in front of you and is the uh, very colourful image uh, towards the bottom of the slide. Uh, and this just highlights kind of, you know, how some of our investments are aligned to the SDGs, um, which is around that framework for a kind of a better future for everybody uh, and the planet. And I'll highlight um, shortly some of how some of our investments are linked to the SDGs and how they link through, uh, which, again, we think is a, a good way of highlighting positive impact alongside financial returns. Now, moving on, hopefully, to the next slide, and there's a, I appreciate there's a little delay between the slides moving over. Uh, and I'm just going to come on to um, so an area which we, des we describe as the green maze, uh, which just basically, you know, brings together, you know, this, this positive momentum that I've just highlighted in, in this area of the market, but then just highlights some of the issues that invest investors need to be aware of um, when actually selecting investments uh, in an ESG and sustainable world. Uh, and on the next slide, I've just highlighted very briefly the kind of the, the broader spectrum of ESG and impact investing. Uh, so you can see on the left hand side, the traditional um, kind of what they call mainstream investing, uh, which didn't really uh, consider ESG risks or, or kind of sustainability risk of the underlying business uh, and their investments and revenue streams, example, uh, for example. And then all the way across to kind of the charitable area, which doesn't really have a, much of a focus on financial returns, is all about that kind of doing good and, you know, again, not focus too much on the, the financial area. And in the red circle, you can kind of see where most of the market is now driving towards, which is this kind of response responsible, sustainable and impact landscape across the three. So this is very much aligning, like I said, the financial return profile that individual savers may need, whether that's for children's tu uh, you know, tuition, university fees, for retirement uh, and so on in their ISAs and pensions. And then you have the kind of positive impact that can sit alongside that. As investors, we kind of sit right in that middle area and sustainable. So we are trying to do good with our client savings. We want to have um, a very much a, a great focus on the uh, return profile of our clients' investments and also trying to have a positive impact on the world and on the planet uh, through these actual investments. So just to highlight, that's the spectrum of investing. You'll, you'll hear different uh, asset managers talk about where they sit. The majority of funds are somewhere in the middle uh, that are coming to the market now and that this is very much the mainstream, uh, we believe, for kind of ESG and sustainable investing going forward. And on the next slide, I've just um, gone into a little bit more detail on. Uh, some of the definitions to be aware of and common phrases. Uh, hopefully you'll be familiar with uh, some of them. Um, so I won't spend uh, too much time explaining what they are, uh, but the evolution of the industry has taken us from the kind of negatively screened ethical approach all the way through to kind of, like I said, this sustainable ESG responsible impact area. So for the ethical investing, traditionally, uh, obviously you have uh, strong links to uh, religious organizations, and would take, you know, an index like such as the FTSE All Share, you know, or the MSCI World, and would strip out approximately half of the half of the underlying companies uh, based on various moral or ethical considerations, whether that be, you know, traditional sin sectors, so alcohol, tobacco, uh, armaments, and so on, pornography, um, and then they would construct their portfolio on the companies that were remaining. 
Now that's very much both focused on kind of uh, revenue thresholds. So they would generally use um, in the region of 10% revenue threshold from an underlying company. Uh, this is very deliberate um, because if you take the example of alcohol and tobacco sales, uh, they wouldn't want to strip out um, the likes of supermarkets from their underlying companies. So 10% still to this day is quite a standard revenue threshold, uh, which is applied on underlying companies uh, when constructing portfolios. And actually still applies even in the sustainable world. The main difference is, you know, a lot of the funds we look at is they'll have the negative screen applied to the traditional sin sectors in most cases, uh, a greater focus now on fossil fuels, as you'd expect. But then within the sustainable area, they will have that positive element of positive ESG screening. So on, on this case, they're looking at companies that are screening well on a variety of environmental, social uh, and governance characteristics. Um, I always get asked what's the most important of the three. Um, I always say governance, which I think surprises um, quite a few people. Um, but the, from my, my perspective and my viewpoint, if you go, get the governance correct, then it should highlight issues with the environmental and the, and the social uh, of the underlying company. You know, with, with that, without good governance, and, you know, we can highlight so many examples here, whether it's the, you know, the, the BP um, deep water horizon kind of um, disaster, or all the way through to Volkswagen and the emission scandals, or more recently, uh, the issues with Boohoo's supply chain, all kind of linked through to, you know, governance issues at the board level and in senior management. So, you know, all three, E and E, S and G are all important. Um, but governance kind of links all those together. So when we're looking at the ESG data, there are hundreds of data points um, on which can be used to compare companies uh, on a like-for-like -like basis. Uh, and we do look at those data points alongside our underlying fund managers that we select when constructing portfolios. Um, so that ESG data is important. Um, the last point I would just make on it is it's evolving. Uh, there are issues on the ESG data as I highlighted earlier. Um, so we're not solely reliant on it, and I'll highlight um, in a moment how we how we integrate that within our investment process. And, and moving on um, to another area, which we think is, again quite helpful for clients when looking at funds in this area, uh, and it, it's, it's a bit of an old-fashioned thing, but you can split uh, funds, and you often hear funds uh, refer to their level of greenness when they are being sold on the green scale. So at the top end, you have dark green funds, um, which exclude large. Um, elements of the universe again focus on those traditional sin areas and quite um, tight screens on the likes of fossil fuels um, and oil, oil and gas all the way through to the light green uh, which tends to use a kind of best-in-class ESG approach um, not really in favor too much of the light green um, very few of our funds in the portfolio are light green um, if I described our fund it would be in the kind of mid green to dark green area and the reason why I say that is um, we, we, we've got minimal exposure to fossil fuels, as I was come on to, but we do have some exposure to financials and a very small exposure to pharmaceuticals, which, again, are not always uh, suitable for some clients. But in the main, we, we see our products as a kind of mainstream product um, and we're quite happy to defend our underlying investments. So that just gives you an idea of the spectrum. Uh, and actually, the, the, the level of greenness is actually quite important for the new regulations on the Article 8 being the kind of dark green funds and then the, uh, sorry, the Article 9 being the dark green funds and the Article 8 kind of being that light to mid green uh, part of the market. So it's a term that I, you know, I don't think is going to go away, uh, but this kind of just gives you an outline of the, the, the types of investments that you would expect to see in a dark green, mid green and light green funds um, in the market. And over the next few slides, apologies, a bit warm in here today. Um, I've just kind of highlighted how we navigate that green maze at Tilney and how we construct our portfolios uh, for clients, um, particularly our centrally managed portfolios. But also this kind of investment process is used for um, some of the bespoke accounts that we manage across the Tilney Smith Williamson Group. Uh, and firstly, just starting on our kind of investment philosophy uh, for sustainable investing. Uh, and this, you know, this was produced a number of years ago. I produced it and it hasn't really changed. Actually, the market's caught up with us, which is which is quite nice to be proved correct. But uh, moving on um, and very much the four, four pillars of this um, investment philosophy. Uh, at Tilney, we do believe that those key themes associate, associated with sustainability are very much mainstream uh, for both businesses and consumers. If you think about how our kind of daily lives and whether it's kind of local produce, or kind of you know the rollout of EV, for example, very much mainstream now for consumers and businesses, um, and we only see this going one way, particularly with kind of the net zero target. So as as the global economy becomes more focused on sustainability, and these legally binding net zero targets, we think this is a very good uh, area to be invested in. 
Um, like I said earlier, we are aligned to the kind of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as part of that blueprint. And as I've highlighted uh, in quite uh, quite some length, you know, despite this positive momentum, there are still issues with investing in this part of the market. Now, to be quite clear, this part, this philosophy sits alongside our wider investment approach, uh, which includes our preserve uh, and grow capital in real terms ethos, um, our 10 principles of manager selection framework, uh, which is used to help us identify both quality investments and quality fund managers. And again, I'll come on uh, briefly to those. Uh, and, you know, this just kind of gives you an idea of the flavour, like I said, of, of the, the investment philosophy that sits behind uh, the various below, um, processes that we apply to uh, fund selection. And on the next slide, I've just highlighted this kind of uh, preserve and grow ethos, which applies across all mandates that we manage on the, on the Tilney side of the business. Um, so this is very much focused on downside protection, uh, not losing clients capital in the first place, uh, and then growing it in excess of inflation over the longer term. Our overriding aim is very much to ensure that our clients are wealthier and their capital can do more for them as a result of investing uh, with us. Importantly, our focus is on consistent absolute returns as opposed to benchmark or peer relative performance uh, because the experience has shown us that kind of that focus on consistent compounding of returns and the protection of count, uh, capital on the downside does lead to relative outperformance compared to both peers and financial markets over the longer term. So this is very much about time in the markets preserving on the downside and growing over the long term. We, we kind of construct kind of diversified portfolios um, depending, depending on the level of risk for each client. Um, but in most cases, we expect our equity allocation to do most of the heavy lifting over the longer term. So when we are selecting funds and equities in particular, we are looking with a kind of you know three to five minimum year horizon and, and onwards. So this is very much about long term investing uh, for our clients. And now moving on, um, I've highlighted a kind of um, our investment process in action, hopefully, if this wants to move. Sorry, can we move on to the next slide, please? There we go. Brilliant. So we're having some technical issues here. Uh, and this just highlights, um, oh, can we go back a slide, please? There we go. I think there's two of us driving at the same time, which is never good. Um, and this just highlights how our sustainable portfolios are managed. I thought there's a bit of a pause and there's a, I think my um, keyboard's got a bit of a mind of its own. Let's do bear with me, I do apologise. There we go. Um, and this just highlights how our uh, sustainable portfolios are managing, uh, managed, sorry, uh, and it combines both bottom-up research, um, ESG and top-down asset allocation. Uh, it's a useful example to show how traditional portfolio management uh, can and does integrate screening, engagement and ESG data. So at the top of the process, um, we have our asset allocation committee, um, which consists of some of the most experienced investors across the business. Uh, we've seen many market cycles, which is very important right now, uh, and, we've, and they will provide a, a, a range of views on macroeconomic factors, asset classes, and regional allocation. Uh, on the left side, we have our investment oversight committee, which is very much focused on kind of governance issues such as liquidity. And on the right hand side, we have our managed portfolio team, uh, which I'm a member of uh, and headed up by our um, Gareth Lewis, who's um, the kind of former CIO and heads up the managed portfolio team. And we are responsible very much for that portfolio construction uh, and ensuring we fulfill our client mandates, which do differ across the portfolios. But as you can see, there is a great deal of work feeding into the kind of fund selection and bottom up part of the process. Uh, so, for example, in the grey box, you will see headlines from our research framework. Uh, which includes our ongoing focus on quality investments and analysis of funds and management. And on the right hand side, you will see how kind of green colored box, um, which we very much focus on our kind of ESG and sustainable input and some of the excellent work already taking place across the combined group uh, on the likes of engagement. Now, both of these work streams uh, do overlap uh, with ESG extremely important, um, an important part of our fundamental research and a, and a focus of both the collectives investment group, which is the kind of mid-tier mid grey box, and on the green box, the um, stewardship and responsible investment group. So ESG is kind of fundamental to both of those work streams and feeds into all of our bottom-up research and is now increasingly becoming part of our top-down work from an asset location point of view, like I said, particularly given the impact of net zero targets on the wider economy going forward. So like I said, that's just a snapshot of our investment, uh, investment process uh, at Tilney for you to be aware of. And on the next slide, I'm just going to highlight uh, very briefly some of the um, screens that we have implied um, to our investment position, um, proposition, sorry. Um, like I said, views in this area of the market do value, <laughs> do, do differ, sorry, um, 
greatly in certain areas. But we think that the, the positive themes, which I've highlighted on this first slide, are very much mainstream areas and, again, sit quite well with most clients that invest in our products. Um, so we are very focused, very much focused on kind of um, investments that are improving, you know, the conservation of energy or natural resources and resource efficiency, uh, which is very much a big theme in our portfolios. Uh, looking for companies that are promoting sustainable transport and infrastructure, um, companies that have high quality products and services uh, for longer term benefits to society, such as healthcare and affordable housing, again, which feature uh, quite heavily in our portfolio, uh, sustainable food and water management. I see this as a big and growing theme over the next five to 10 years. Small amount of companies in comparison to some of the other areas at the moment, but do see this as a you know, very strong growth area uh, in the years to come, particularly if you think about uh, the kind of sustainability of our water and, and food resources uh, and that pressure on a, you know, from, derived from a growing population and climate change. Uh, and then also we're looking for companies that are kind of supportive of the United Nations Develop Sustainable Development Goals. Um, that promote, you know, strong employee um, relations, community relations, and have a strong record on the likes of human rights, which is obviously very important, particularly in the emerging markets. And on the next screen uh, slide, sorry, I've just highlighted the, the traditional sin sectors that we look to avoid. Again, I don't believe there's anything too controversial here, uh, but this just helps, you know, give our clients some assurances about where we will and where we won't invest. So we won't be investing in uh, companies that are involved with the production of weapons and weapon systems. Um, that are contributing to environmental damage uh, and unsustainable resource depletion, uh, which includes water, air pollution and land contamination, uh, businesses in involved with gambling and casinos, uh, businesses that are, are kind of in violation of those human and worker rights, uh, companies that are um, producing pornographic material uh, or producing alcohol for human consumption, and lastly, companies involved with the production of tobacco. So those are, that's kind of where we draw the line in the sand. And those are the screens that we have applied to our portfolio, uh, which again, I, I, I suspect will, will be recognized by, by most given these are the traditional uh, scenarios. And then moving on to the uh, next slide, I've provided um, a kind of some highlights of our, um, of our portfolio. And I appreciate this hasn't come out that clearly, I don't believe, but what you can see in front of you on the right hand side is our asset allocation uh, for the uh, for the TAP sustainable portfolio, which is a kind of cautiously managed uh, risk profile. We do have other strategies um, with a higher risk profile depending on, on client need. Uh, so you can see equities uh, equate for around 45% of the portfolio. We then have some investment in investment grade corporate bonds, um, particularly focused on lower duration, given the outlook uh, for interest rates and inflation. Uh, we have a real assets allocation. Uh, which is investing in uh, a number of kind of infrastructure rel related um, closed ended companies. So this includes um, solar and wind farms, um, which we've got invested in the portfolio. We also have a uh, very much positive allocation to affordable housing and the provision of housing for those with disabilities. So these are kind of um, more specialized social housing, very much focused on housing people with longer term disabilities within their communities. And we get a nice income yield from that as investors. So positive impact alongside the financial return, uh, which is kind of an ideal investment for us. Uh, we also have now have our kind of first absolute return vehicle in, in, the, in the fund. Uh, and, and where there are gaps in the market, like I highlighted earlier, we will get involved with um, asset managers and look to seed and design new portfolios. So one such example um, is the 24 uh, short term sustainable bond fund, which we, we were seed investors of. Uh, and has grown subsequently, short duration, um, kind of high, high um, rated credit, um, again, helped fill a massive hole we had in our portfolio. So we're, we're delighted to do that. And even on some of the infrastructure vehicles that, you know, for example, Greencoat UK Wind, which we invest in, you know, we were early investors at IPO back in 2013. And delighted that, you know, this vehicle and the wider sector have now grown significantly uh, where they can power, you know, millions of UK homes, have a positive impact on the environment. And again, as investors, we can get a nice, um, nice return, um, which hopefully, uh, as my compliance department, I'm sure would like me to say, um, will continue over the longer term, but uh, no guarantees on past performance being uh, replicated in, in, in future returns. And then below that, you can see, um, hopefully you can see some of our kind of ESG portfolio data that we highlight. Uh, so for example, um, not only at the front end are we applying screens, uh, but at the back end, we also test our portfolios to ensure that our screens are not being breached. Uh, and what you may not be able to see quite clearly, but you will be able to on the download that's available afterwards. We have 0% direct exposure to alcohol, uh, gambling, the likes of palm oil, weapons, 
um, and adult entertainment, oil sands, and tobacco, which is great. So we run that through our back-ended um, screen using Morningstar analytics data. And we also have less than 1% direct exposure to fossil fuels across the portfolio. Um, where we do have that small amount pulling through, this tends to be um, within the fixed income part of the uh, portfolio. Uh, and this is very much, um, sorry, not very much. This is very much, I've said it twice. Um, this is coming through from um, a small exposure to gas utilities within the fixed incomes. So we will tend to be more in the kind of national grid area. Um, our absolute return fund does at the moment have a kind of long exposure to Allstead. Well, again, we're, re we're, we're reasonably happy with that being a kind of transition story. And that's kind of where that, not, you know, 0.9%, I believe the latest figure is, is pulling in from. So we don't really invest in any kind of, you wouldn't see BP or Shell or anything like that in this portfolio. Um, and that just highlights kind of, again, you know, how we construct the portfolios. But even within the asset, the kind of the regional allocations, which you can see on the right still, we also look to blend risk between funds. So, for example, in our UK weighting, um, we invest currently in the Line Trust UK ethical fund, uh, which is more of an all cap growth focused uh, investment fund, which has, again, performed well for us. And we're, we're happy with it. We will blend that with kind of the Trojan ethical income fund, which is a larger cap, uh, more defensive investment vehicle with a higher exposure to global revenues. So we'll blend those two together. And that, again, tends to give us a investment return profile that we're uh, more comfortable with. We do the same in the global allocations. So we have kind of some core large cap global uh, defensive funds that are focused on kind of the likes of healthcare and consumer staples. And then we'll blend those with kind of more uh, mid and small cap funds such as Impact and Web, uh, which are more thematic and focused on the kind of the greener uh, evolution of the economy. So that's kind of how we blend and how we think about, again, portfolio construction. Again, more than happy in the future to talk about uh, that to anyone that's interested. On the next slide, we've just provided some examples of some recent investments. So first up is the uh, renewables infrastructure group uh, listed on the FTSE 250 um, and invests in over 75 renewable infrastructure projects across the UK, France, Sweden and Germany. Um, we get a nice yield again from these infrastructure assets uh, and as you can see some of the UN SDG alignment on the bottom. So this is contributing to uh, some of the, obviously the climate action, uh, sustainable um, future, affordable and clean energy. So you can start to see some of the SDG links and again we're, we're quite happy with this um, this investment is a, it's a trust we've, we've, we've covered for a number of years. And on the next slide, we've got the sustainable short term bond fund, which I just highlighted. Again, it's a low, low volatility investment um, that we're, again, happy to invest in and we help design and seed. And it now fills uh, a part of our portfolio. Uh, and on the last example I provided is a kind of um, a higher beta equity fund that we invest in is the Rubico Sam Smart Materials Fund. Um, materials um, and commodities more generally are, you know, fairly small exposures for us in this fund, given the ESG and ethical screens applied, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but we do see that kind of transition, particularly around kind of the electric vehicles in the future and the electrification of the global economy being an important um, kind of pillar. Uh, and again, being a transition story uh, for those looking to have positive impacts. Rubico Sam is very much a, you know established fund in this area and gives that exposure to materials that we're, we're kind of hoping from, but in, a, in an ESG friendly kind of way. Um, again, we think that, you know, this is going to be a, you know, a growing part of the market, particularly given um, what appears to be an emerging, a new emerging commodity super cycle kind of around some of the inputs into electrification. And then on the next slide, I've highlighted the uh, performance of um, the TAP Sustainable Portfolio, which is our kind of, uh, like I said, cautiously managed products on the green line. You will see outperformance of our kind of art balanced uh, peer group over the, over the last 10 years. And our, our actual uh, real terms uh, performance objective of CPI plus one and a half. Again, past performance is not a guide to future returns. My compliance department will want me to say. But again, we're very much happy with our performance. And this slide just highlights um, that you do not have to give up. We do not believe returns to have a positive impact with your investments. And on the next slide, we just have this in uh, tabulated format, uh, format, which you can see very badly by the looks of it but you can just see the again the returns over the longer term of the portfolios um, all of our portfolios and despite that kind of a bit of a headwind this year for kind of growth investments and quality investments we're still continuing to um, deliver our return profile and our objectives for our clients and we expect that kind of performance hopefully like I said to continue over the kind of the short medium and longer term going forward uh, for clients. And I'm just about to run up out of time, I believe, uh, and we'll finish with a kind of Q&A sec uh, section where I'm happy to answer any questions um, that anyone listening uh, might have. I'm just going to pause for a water break.
Okay. And I've got the first question um, coming in here, which I can see, um, which is um, a lot of the success of ESG funds have been a consequence of investments in tech. What are the genuine observations of ESG strong businesses? Now, that's a really good question, actually. Um, tech, tech's an interesting area, and I, it, it really depends on what part of the tech area you're looking at. Um, so, for example, you know, it, are you looking at kind of social media companies? Are you looking at the Amazons or, you know, uh, Netflix and, and Google, et cetera. Um, I, we, we, a lot of our investments, we, we, we do have some investments in Microsoft, um, but a lot of our investments tend to be in kind of financial technology. So opening up uh, finance to particularly in the emerging markets for people that have never had bank accounts, et cetera. Um, so we're not, we, we've got a small overweight to tech, but we, we're not massively overweight technology. Um, in terms of the genuine observations of ESG strong businesses, like you said, it's that focus on kind of uh, governance of the actual business. You know, how's the business managed? Uh, you know, is this a quality business that we believe can you know grow over the longer term and, and is taking the E and the S very seriously? Um, so I think the genuine observations of the ESG, like I said, it is, you know, how are they managing the day to day operations? You know, what is their kind of revenue profile looking at? Um, and in particular, you know, given the focus of tech at the moment, what is that kind of revenue generation in both the kind of short, medium and longer term? Uh, and that's a that's a real challenge for for some businesses uh, and for some analysts in the market, particularly when you're looking at an emerging technology coming through, which doesn't necessarily have a proven kind of revenue profile to start with. I suppose the, the most obvious example is probably Tesla, um, which we which we don't actually invest in, mainly on governance concerns. But that's the kind of business profile which a lot of the market are really trying to get their head around now around, you know, is this a strong ESG business? Can it actually deliver um, the kind of revenues that would be required, and the earnings that would be required to actually catch up with the valuation? Um, so it's, it's an interesting one. And it leads quite nicely into the kind of the, the next question, which are um, what are my views on, on, on crypto assets? Um, we hear that the traditional firms are moving into. Um, Really difficult question. Um, our asset allocation committee and other investors have started to look at uh, a little bit closer at, at crypto. Um, don't invest in it. I think actually do share some of the concerns that have been raised around the environmental aspects of kind of mining the crypto. Um, you know, we, we hold our cash in you know traditional managed money funds. Uh, we're not really looking to invest in crypto in this space. But again, I I, I believe it's an area of the market that you know the more traditional areas are, are going to start looking at more closely. Uh, and I'm sure, again, again, I'm not the expert on, on crypto, but I'm, I'm sure there will be, you know, more information provided in due course. I think there is, a, again, concerns around the ESG uh, governance and environmental side of crypto at the moment and, and how actually uh, the currency is used um, by some of the investors in crypto. I'm just going to move on to some of the other questions I've got in front of me. Um, so the next question on here is, um, are there presently too many investors chasing too few green or sustainable ESG investment opportunities? If so, what is the risk of creating a bubble? Uh, this is a great question. Um, and in short, I believe uh, in some certain parts of the market, I believe there are risks of a bubble being created. Um, I think, um, I think particular, you know, certain areas, there are few companies with a lot of assets chasing it. Uh, in, if you look at the clean technology and the kind of rally that we had um, last year in particular, um, Valuations got certainly too hot, I would say. Um, actually, in that pullback we've seen year to date actually makes the clean technology area um, slightly more attractive than it was. Uh, but I think this is this is a very important point that you know people you know need to be aware of. What I would say is though that there actually is significant growth in the number of companies that are qualifying for ESG mandates. So therefore, that does de-risk slightly the kind of the bubble um, the bubble factors and th those risks because more companies spread the investment more widely. Um, I think what probably more interesting if you flip the argument and look at the conversation from a different point of view is how much actual kind of uh, money is going to be able to buy some of these traditional sin sectors as those regulations ramp up. So th what does that mean for the future of tobacco? Where will they receive capital from from in, from a you know private you know public capital markets? What happens to the tobacco market in the next five, 10, 15 years? And whether that is a better outcome for society or not. And I think that's a really important debate because arguably publicly listed traded companies do have a greater kind of transparency and, and kind of governance uh, applied to them. But what happens if those some of these companies are forced to go 
um, into a private market. Is that a good or, or a bad thing for society? And I think that's a really interesting you know, debate that, again, is not really going to go away. But just to answer the question directly again, I, I think there are certain areas of the market that have looked very hot. Um, but I think the longer term, I just think this is mainstream investing. You know, very few funds now come to us and present to us as a, you know, as a big wealth manager that are not talking about ASG uh, in some format. Um, how they apply it can, can differ quite greatly. Um, and again, that gives me some reassurances that, you know, this isn't just a bubble. I think, you know, finding companies that we believe can grow over the longer term and are high quality and take ESG seriously, that's just for us. It's just, you know, bread and butter. That's that's what we think um, will, will be applied to, to most investments over the longer term. And then lastly, I think I've just got time for one more question. Uh, what are your thoughts on industries that may be bad for the environment, but have some companies that are trying to be better, such as fast fashion? Uh, that's a good question. Um, fast fashion is a really interesting one actually and where we go i've seen a number of um kind of high street brands such as hm and h&m are looking more at the kind of recycle you can take goods back in and try and the fast fashion i mean that's great i think fast fashion and some of the environmental impacts linked to the production are very much troublesome um yeah it, it it's a tricky one i think if you go back to the revenue screens that i was talking about earlier a lot of those companies will be automatically screened out uh, and won't necessarily be able to pick up some of the positive ESG. That's why I think it's important that you, you apply both negative and positive ESG criteria. Uh, so therefore you can try and pick up some of those companies that are helping with the transition to a more sustainable future that are in a typically negative uh, industry. Uh, so the likes of also is probably a company I would highlight, you know, or any kind of com you know, company, it's a traditional energy company moving towards renewables. You know, they're gonna have a great impact on the kind of world going forward in their energy landscape. So I do believe you can find companies that are involved with, you know, traditionally, uh, traditional scenarios that you want to avoid in certain industries that can have a positive impact for the future. But doing your work, doing your homework, looking kind of closely at what the company is doing is very important, particularly in those industries um, which are, you know, quite troublesome from, a, from an environmental uh, perspective in particular. And thank you. I think I think that's the the kind of end of the questions. Um, just just to finish, um, I'd firstly, just say thank you to um, for everyone that watched today's presentation. Um, if you would like to watch the presentation again, uh, is available on demand. Uh, all conference sessions will be made available on replay, uh, the replay on the event platform. Uh, by, I'm told by the end of today, and also available for 30 days after the event. Uh, this includes additional sessions which are exclusively available on the demand function. Uh, you can also compare your notes uh, and exchange your thoughts in our discussion zone uh, with your fellow attendees. And, and like I said earlier, please make sure you go and visit the kind of virtual exposition. Uh, it's, it's another great opportunity to speak with um, the likes of my colleagues, Roth and, and Miles, that will be here on the behalf of Tilney and Smith and Williamson. And lastly, please don't forget to fill in the uh, speaker survey, which can be found in our participate tab. Uh, and we would very much appreciate your feedback. Thank you very much for listening and do apologize for some of the minor technical issues during the presentation. Thank you.